Hi, I'm Dan Gaffney and joining me on the couch today is Dr. Julian Cox. He's uh, an expert in food, food science and a passionate communicator about that topic and others. Welcome to the couch, Julian. Thanks, Dan. Happy to be here. One of your areas of expertise speaking about that is food and nutrition and the science therein. Um, I I'm curious t to hear your take on this question. It's a large topic. Food's been around for a long time. Human culture's been around for a long time. The ancient Greeks, the ancient Egyptians knew a lot about food, presumably. Um, are we any smarter or more knowledgeable or literate about food as a culture than they were? Oh, I think so. I think what we have more than what they had was, was the whys. We understand why certain foods are the way they are. That's what science has done for us. If we go back to those ancient times, particularly when civilization began, I mean, we really found that, that they were already experimenting in a, a very haphazard way in creating new foods. They learned how to preserve foods using drying, using salt, and some of the same processes we still use today. They were producing fermented foods, uh, bread, wine, beer, and they didn't know how those products were made in the scientific sense. They really just knew in a, in a very broad process sense how those happened. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they realized very quickly how they could take various food products, improving the variety of foods, and also how they could extend the shelf life of food. So they had a, a, a much better food supply than the, uh, their predecessors, the hunter-gatherers. Uh, so you've mentioned the storage of food, but it seems like there's a lot of fast food around these days, Julian. Um, what is it that fast food outlets and franchises do well around the taste of food in particular? I don't know if it's so much the, the taste. I think it, it's purely the, the convenience angle that has got buy-in from society in general because whether it's true or not, we certainly perceive ourselves as increasingly time poor, that for many people, food is that fast fix. You know, we, we recognise it's a need. In some cases, it's a want. But basically, it's a very quick, convenient way uh, of getting that process, <laughs> natural process, out of the way so we can then move on to other things. Uh, I don't think that fast food is quite the, the problem that we perceive provided it's, it's something that we consume in moderation. I mean, some of the nutritionists I know will, will say that the occasional Big Mac in an otherwise balanced diet is perfectly reasonable. If you eat uh, hamburgers all the time, they're certainly not good for you, and I think we can all see that as pretty much common sense. Uh, I think one of, the really, one of the cases in point in terms of how society is re-responding to fast food is the way the fast food industry is recognising that they can't get away with providing what we perceive traditionally as fast food. You know, fat, grease, lots of sugar. We're seeing increasingly a lot of healthy options appearing in the fast food menus of, of a range of chains, of franchises. And of course we're seeing some fast food outlets that base their business on a platform of, of healthy eating. Some of those long sandwiches, for example, just trying to avoid brand names. Mm. Just talking about, uh, uh, down to fundamentals, about nutrition, I mean, you mentioned fat, you mentioned sugar, for example. What is it about chocolate in particular that, that, that is so great to, to the human taste buds? It's an interesting question. Uh, I think it's a whole range of things because there's, there's the flavour in itself. There's also the, the fat that the cocoa butter that goes into chocolate is a, a very unusual type of fat. To try and re reproduce that is very, very difficult. A lot of people have tried to look at ways they can actually get that same sensation from the fat using, using fats from other sources. Uh, the fat melts beautifully in the mouth and it's got a lusciousness that's quite different. We know that some fats, for instance, on meats are, are too solid at body temperature, so they have a greasy feel. Others are quite liquid and have an oily feel, but we get that lusciousness from the, the fat. We've also, of course, got some of the, the chemicals that come from the cocoa bean that give us that sense of euphoria. They affect the brain, they, they affect our, our breathing, they make us feel good. And so people get used to that. I mean, you can probably actually get hooked on, on chocolate in the same way you might get hooked on something more illicit. But I think it's that combination. I mean, the, the, the beautiful flavours and aromas, the, the lusciousness of the fat, and also these chemicals within the chocolate that really give us this sense of well-being, of euphoria. Right, so it's that fantastic mouthfeel and a bit of an orgasm for the brain, is that it? That's one way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> um, it surprises me when I go to 
to restaurants these days, sometimes high-end restaurants, and I see bangers and mash on the menu, and I think, gosh, I'm going back to the 1960s. What's that about? Uh, I think, to me, it's trying to marry people's comfort zone with, uh, with new approaches to the delivery of those old favourites. So that people, as you said, see something on the menu that says bacon and eggs or bangers and mash. But when you see what's being done with that dish, uh, it might be a, a very beautifully handcrafted banger. Or it might be that what they've done with that dish is deconstructed and reconceptualised that dish so that it's actually something that doesn't look like the traditional bangers and mash. And it's giving you that sense of surprise and putting that new twist on an old favourite. 